for me as an actor, I knew that these things were obvious all the time, the misogyny and the things that were going on in court. So why would I add something to it? It didn't make sense to me, you know, because it would reveal itself and everybody would see it. And the calmer I am, the worse it gets for them. I hate to embarrass you, but I don't think it's an overestimation. And I hope you don't mind, but I want to sort of go back to the beginning because I fear that the majority of the American audiences won't have seen you in anything. So I know that you were born in East Germany. What can you tell us about your childhood that you believe infuses the work you do today? Oh. Um, well, it's not related to the GDR, obviously, it's kind of, I've always, I've been a child who liked to observe a lot. Um, I loved watching people and figuring out what's going on. Um, I think that's it. I didn't have a lot of hobbies, I wasn't very social, I had two friends in school, we were doing everything together. Yeah, that's it. So you move to Berlin, <laughs> yes. You yeah. go to the Ernst Busch Academy. I wonder if you can describe what that training was like to some degree for us. You know, maybe some of your favorite roles or the valuable lessons you took with you. It's a stage school, so you learn about stage acting, about how you create status, how you move on a stage, how you use your body, your voice, how you do not injure yourself how not necessarily how to protect yourself. That's what comes very much later. Nobody teaches you that. That's unfortunate, but it's the truth. Um, it's a yeah, it's a life thing, a life lesson that needs to be learned. But um, yeah, we had sort of the basic trainings. We learned um, stage fight and singing and fencing and acrobatics and all these things that we never use, really. <laughs> Except, <laughs> except the singing. Um, it's a very, I think it's a very traditional stage education. And what I, I think what I mostly understood discipline and to fight through things and to trust the process because, um, and when you are in theater for a long time, you learn it, it's always like the same three or four phases of a rehearsal process and um, that you can just relax, it will all be fine in the end. So this is kind of, what I, I take with me all the time, yeah. So how would you describe those same three or four phases of the rehearsal process? I think in the beginning it's excitement, of course. Uh, we don't know each other, we uh, read the lines for the first time, and then we're excited, we try things, and everything seems to work. And then you get to a certain point where you kind of have an idea how this could go, then it gets a little boring. Then some people start to fight, either with the director or with each other. Some people are very, very desperate. Uh, and then come the last two weeks where we put everything together and we say, now this has to work. And then like the last energy that's still there comes in and then we start to fly. That's mostly the, the process all the time. I want to ask you a little bit about the German industry because the film and um, theater industry is state funded. And I wonder if, well, this, I'd love you to tell us how you think it's different. And I think it has something to do with, ex you know, my interest is in experience, the experience that comes from working in that industry. Um. Well, when you have, when you are lucky and have a contract with a theater, which is mostly for in the beginning, it's for two years, and you can make it longer and longer and longer if you have the feeling you work together really well. So I know people who've been in a theater for 20, 25 years um, in the same place, um, and they're really happy with it. Some of them are happy, some are not. Um, they just stay there because their family is in the place and they don't want to move, and you know. Um, it's, it feels really safe, actually. It feels like a safe place to work. And uh, also you cannot force anybody to play something that they don't want. It doesn't make sense. That's what I learned really early. If you want to leave, you can always 
leave. In the beginning I thought, oh, now I have this contract and I have to stay here, but then I realized, no, it's not true. If we, we don't get along, we don't need to be together. Um, yeah, so it's the, the, that we get to know each other so well in an ensemble that there are like 25 people sometimes in such an ensemble. Um, that really is a very, <laughs> I like it a lot because you can really focus on what you want to create. You don't need to focus on finding out how the whole social thing is working in this group or if you work in another city, where's the next supermarket, where can I get, where's the doctor, you know, all these things. So you really go to this place and you are really only working with the text. That's all you do. And um, so it's a really focused way of working. I really like it. And I, I just for the benefit of everybody, I mean, Tony Erdman, I think, was one of the <laughs> best dark comedies I've ever seen. Has, it, has everybody seen it? If you haven't, you need to add it to your list. But your first film, Requiem, um, I mean, you won the Best Actress Award at the Berlin Film Festival for your first film. And then every single film role you've had since then, you've won a Best Actress Award in Europe for. You've won four German Best Actress Film Awards. And I know that the confidence comes from doing the work, but I'm also wondering, how does it impact the work to receive that kind of recognition? Yeah, I don't know because I only know it this way. So it's really kind of sad. I really can't. I can't come. It's 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 stupid to say, but I can't compare. Uh, I'm I, f I consider myself really lucky, and I've always felt like maybe it's the right path. If people, as long as people like what I do, understand what I do, can relate to what I do, as long as people are touched by what I do, I can go on. That's it. If it doesn't mean that I necessarily need to get a, a recognition for everything that I do. Most of the time I know if it was really good or not, even while I'm making it. Um, but of course it's, yeah, I, it's, it's very encouraging. Yeah, of course. And you are an accomplished theater actress. You, you've been in many, many plays. And recently, Rebecca Mead um, published a very engaging uh, interview with you. And I think the thing that's so striking is she talks about a recent production where you played Hamlet. And during the intermission, you, are, you stay on stage while you're thinking. And she called it electric drama. And I was so struck by the idea that somebody would watch you stand on stage thinking for 20 minutes and describe it as electric drama. <laughs> what were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I cherish this very long moment so much. I cannot even tell there are not so many moments of real peace in my life where nothing is going on. And I kind of, embrace it as a sort of meditation or a pause and I th yeah I really think I think about the stage that I'm standing on sometimes I'm in contact with some parts of the audience and of course we don't speak but I f kind of think I recognize a connection or whatever it's maybe it's just in my head um, I think about the piece that we're playing about my colleagues what is going to happen next about my real father because it's a piece about a, s a child and a father and the family, so yeah, it's a, there's a, there are a lot of things going on, and I've, I think I'm always really happy when I'm there at that moment, yeah. Fear of failure. Oh, I also, I, I heard that you, I heard you say on stage you can't make a mistake. Do you still think that's true? Um, yeah, you can't, oh, oh man, that's really <laughs> difficult, that's really difficult to answer. I think you can make the mistake to, to want to make it really right, because it's, I think that doesn't exist. I think it's what I've learned from, I mean, it's more than 20 years now that I'm, I have, I'm lucky to play on stage, is that as long as I'm connected to my partners, nothing can really go wrong. It's really my experience. It went wrong when I really wanted too much. It went wrong when I was too eager to achieve something, when I was not listening to the audience at the same time when I'm playing. I was not including them in the performance. I wanted to do it on my own. 
and when I was too much inside my own stuff. So yeah, I think that could be a mistake, but not a mistake in a sort of forgetting a line or you know saying something differently than the, the night before or something like that. I don't I don't think that this is a mistake. No. I love that. I'm going to travel forward with that in my mind always. Um, fear of failure is a central sort of obviously theme in this movie. There are so many, it's so layered and so complex. But um, this idea of experience and you striving to al align yourself with your character in terms of truth and honesty, would you say that your portrayal of Sandra is the closest you've come to achieving this kind of al alignment with the character where you, where you are so free? Well, I think it's the most mature uh, character that I've ever had the chance to play. The most unapologetic, the most the the person who owns her feelings the most and who owns her own truth the most and who's standing up for her own mistakes and the the way that she's hurting people sometimes so she stands yeah for for me she's yeah the, the most mature but i don't know if it's the closest that i with hamlet it felt kind of the same it is really managing to be really there, being really in the moment. It's something that we always say, but it, when you you know it, when you know what I mean, it's something that you cannot describe. When you're really in this place with these people in this time, and there is no, it it couldn't be elsewhere or with anybody else or with any other story. Um, so that yeah, I would say that happened. Yeah. The story is so layered um, and it's sort of amazing stakes for an actress, just wonderful. There's so much going on and it's almost as if the more that is revealed, the less we realize we knew about you. And it's so easy for us to project our experience and our thoughts onto your performance and... Um, I'm wondering how you, you know, I think it's about your physical reactions. Mm -hmm. Do you act out every possibility? If I have the chance to, I, I love to. Uh, Justine is a director who gives you this chance to like do every sort of variation that you can think of, even when you think it's really bad. If everybody knows it's really bad, let's just do it because it could lead to something else. Uh, and at least we kind of X'd out this version. It's not this version, it's maybe another one. Um, and she's kind of, a, she's a collecting director. There are directors who go to this aim, to this goal, and then they want to be there. And they do the scenes as long uh, as, and until they have this thing that they want. And she's kind of, she has this big basket, which is, I think, a very female thing to collect and this and this and this. I like this one. I don't even know why I want this. I just want it. And I look at it later. I will look at it later and think, oh, can I use this? No, maybe not. I would take it out and then this I can use. And um, yeah, and for me as an actor, that's like the most beautiful thing to happen because then, yeah, I can, it's not even about forming a character. It's like finding out what is in there. And there's always much more than we think. Um, what if she reacts this way? What if the truth is around this corner? Um, and also, what if my partner does a completely different thing? And what am I going to do with that? So, I wanted to ask, like in the beginning, the first time in the morning when you retell the story to Renzi, your lawyer friend, it's the first time we're hearing the story, it's the first time you're telling him the story, but it's the third time you've told it. And I was wondering, you know, how, how much of what was on the screen was instinctual on the day and how much was a response to the, the actor Swan Arno, is that correct? Swan mm -hmm. How much of it was a response to his performance? Um, I really have to say that we did this together, like all of it. Um, also with Milo, even with the dog. It's, really, it's something that I don't like to play alone. 
I wouldn't have become an actor if I wanted to work alone. Then I would have, I don't know, been a writer or a painter. Or um, So I really like the connection and I like to have the impulse from the other person. So yeah, we played the scene together from beginning to the end. And um, I don't think about what I want to do in a scene when we start doing it. It's just from a, like a point of zero, being there, and then something happens, and then I react, or I have to do something so that the other person can react to it. But it's not; it's never a plan. I don't sort of believe, maybe I get in a situation one day in my life where I have to have a plan, but so far it went very well without it. Um, because I feel like it, it would limit the things that could happen between us. If I would like think about what I want to do, and where I want to end in the scene, and what I want to tell, then the other person is kind of out of the game. We can't we can't do it together. So I yeah I mostly choose to be there and to do it with the other person. So it was with Swan, yes. Yeah, and I a couple of follow ups. I'm just wondering how aware you are of where the camera is and what the shot is because your reactions are so like honest. You know, are you aware of where the camera no, is? No, never. Yeah. And it's like a, it's like something that I'm really ashamed of. I really don't know how this works. No, I really don't. And uh, I think there are some directors who are really getting crazy about this because, yeah, you can't. Some some people can't work with such a person when they don't know how to. You know, where's the li how? Yeah, how it's visible. I even worked with someone, and the energy between us wasn't very good. So I tended to turn this way when the camera was there. <laughs> and I didn't realize until she told me, you're always hiding, what are you doing? And I was thinking, yeah, maybe think about it for a second, but. <laughs> yeah, so it's about, yeah, if, if we're lucky, we have camera people who, who, who's, uh, who have the capacity to at the same time disappear and be absolutely present so, and, and make you feel safe. Um, that you don't feel like they steal something from you or they cheat on you or whatever. So it's like a, it's a, it's a personal thing uh, to me. Annie, you are at a text. I'm wondering because this is so language heavy. I mean, apart from the fact that you're acting in French and English, and of course, you have performed in French films, German films, English films, Austrian, you know. Um, but 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 it is so text heavy, and so were you at a stage each day where the text, you know, how comfortable were you? Did it feel like you were reciting text? Did it just come out? I mean, how? Where are you with the lines when you get to set? In this case, I had to know them very well. Uh, this is something that I I don't like to struggle with the text, and it only happened once where I had to play a robot. And I realized after why, because they didn't know why they speak and there's no story behind it. It was just empty words all the time. So I didn't know where it came from. So I forgot my lines. It was the only time. Um, but in this case, it, that's the great thing about this kind of work when you work with different languages, because it's kind of the topic of the film. So the character is struggling with the language. I am struggling, so something is matching. I don't need to pretend anything. It's like my focus must be so much higher and I have to listen so much more closely to my partners because they speak French so fast. And I have to answer in English, so I basically had to learn their lines too so that I don't get lost in what they say. Um, so it's kind of a, yeah, I just embraced this uncomfortable, it was uncomfortable, but I liked it that it was uncomfortable. It wasn't painful or anything, but it was uncomfortable, of course, because it is an uncomfortable situation that she's in. And I felt like I shouldn't run away from it. It's interesting because I think for actors, often words are the last resort. And when you're in a, you know, you have a screenplay that has so many words, but also Sandra does have, you know, a really interesting physicality. You know, I, I, we can see your grief when you first go up to the attic to give him the tour, you know, and you're not sure-footed up there. It's, can you speak a little bit about the physicality of Sandra? Yeah, I think she's. she seems to be very slow. I think she's moving very slow and very little. 
Um, I don't know why. I really don't know why it just happened because we barely see her walk somewhere. She's basically sitting, oh, also of course in court. Um, the physicality of her, I, I didn't think about it. I have to be honest, I have no idea. <laughs> oh. I just felt that, I mean, they gave me clothes that were very, they were embracing the body, they were very comfortable, cozy and warm. So it kind of felt like a caving, like she was in a cave or something. Because the, I think the, what you're saying about the grief, that's a very important thing that some people don't speak so much about when they see the film, but I think it's the, that's like the main thing that she's struggling with. Um, and that is not recognized, uh, of course, also not by the court or anybody. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like you have to suppress the grief to yeah, get course. through yeah. w w what's in front of you. And, you know, I think one of the times when, I, and did you choose beats in the script? You know, I think we have to speak about your relationship with um, your son. Milo, I know you're going to pronounce it better than me, Masharo Grena, <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I, I was grief stricken when I watched you put him to bed the first night, you know, because, and throughout the film, I, it's very palpable when you look at him in court that he's, what he's going through is of great concern to you. And so I wonder if you can just, you know, and there are heartbreaking moments when he asks you to leave the house, I mean, there were just. <laughs> can you describe how you carved out those beats of grief and loss and concern for your son? Well, Milo is somebody who, who gives you a lot of freedom as an actor. You don't need to take care of him. That's the first thing. So it, I didn't have the feeling that I'm playing with a child. He's very mature, and he's very aware of his own space and his independence and, you know, his rights. And um, uh, he's very smart, yeah, and a very talented actor. So um, our relationship or the relationship that we have as mother and son in the film basically came from his behavior because he was so with himself. He wasn't somebody who would come over and want a hug or something. He was in his space and I let him be there. I thought maybe it's a good idea, maybe it's what they are. Um, and also because I think the relationship to the father is so difficult and it's taking so much space in the family that she somewhat decided to step back a little, just not to make it too complicated. Um, and um, yeah, I tried to use every moment that I had with him to build up a, a connection, of course. But at the same time, I, we were very aware that we didn't want to portray a usual, I didn't want to portray a mother who's all over the place with him because that's not what she's doing. She's she's leaving space for everything that's going on. That's For some people that's a problem. Uh, for her husband it is a problem, but um, it shouldn't be for her son. And I think, um, yeah, I think that's what happened in a way. It, it's fascinating, I think, to when we get towards the end and you realize that her fate is to some extent in his hands. Um, Justin Trier, who you... Is that... <laughs> terrified I'm mispronouncing names. No, no, it's fine. Justin Trier, yeah. Um, you had obviously worked with her once before and she wrote this film specifically for you, which must be a burden. I imagine no, it's a burden. No, no. But she, she said that the scene where you melt down in the car was shocking, stunning, that she was stunned by your performance, which I thought was a beautiful thing for her to say. But she also said that you challenged her in making this film. So I'm wondering, what did you want to change? Was there something that you wanted to change? Because you obviously had such a deep understanding of who Sandra is. No, I didn't. No, I didn't want to. Ch no, I didn't want to change a thing. I mean, it's not that she said we we do it this way, and I said no. I have another idea. Just we got together in the morning, had our coffee. We kind of didn't go into costume until we staged. Uh, she showed us the room, and she showed us what she thinks is going on, like spacing wise, and then we tried these things out, so the light could be built and and all these things. Uh, and then we went to the to the to the other department. Um, so, 
and yeah, I, I think we started to discuss everything in the morning and then everybody went into their own thoughts and then we came back after hair and makeup and then we just started. But it's not, no, I didn't want to change it. She always says that I added something to it that she didn't have in the script, but I don't see it. Uh, to me, it was <laughs> all very obvious. <laughs> And um, maybe she thought that she would be, that Sandra would be more furious or something, or fight more or more obviously or something. But I felt, and it's not something that we discussed very much, but I felt that the responsibility for the son who's watching everything makes her so, uh, makes her keep everything inside because she, uh, who wants their child to see them break down? You know, nobody wants to see their mother cry. It's like the worst thing that can happen. So it's this responsibility that made it so, I don't know the word, that she has it inside all the time. I thought um, it sort of, you, Sandra exercised great restraint, particularly when the therapist comes to um, court to share his interpretation. Um, I was, you know, I just imagined that... <laughs> That you, that you would be furious with the things that he's saying and he's interrupting you as if his word is more important than yours. And of course, I think misogyny and gender roles are also something that we're examining here. And also that interrogating prosecutor is so aggressive. And so good. <laughs> <laughs> so much fun with him. Yeah. He challenged me Oh, so much. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, but what would happen if she would lose it? I mean, then she would lose everything. So, and she knows, so she has to keep it somewhere. And of course, for me as an actor, I knew that these things were obvious all the time, the misogyny and the things that were going on in court, so why would I add something to it? It didn't make sense to me, you know, because it would reveal itself and everybody would see it. And the calmer I am, the worse it gets for them, so. Searing intelligence. Um. So we have to talk about this explosive scene in the midst of the courtroom drama, which is so theatrical in as much as it's five, six, seven minutes of this amazing, amazing argument between you and Samuel Thies, Thies who plays your husband. And the thing that struck me so much, I'd really love you to sort of talk through every twist and turn of that conversation because I love it when you stand up and pour a glass of wine and tell him to relax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, Justine and Arthur told me that they had 60 written versions of that scene. It was very important to Justine because it's kind of the center of the thing and she knew that if we, sh if we would fail, <laughs> the whole film, would you could f just forget it. So it had to work. And uh, it had to work in a way that we understand both of them and that we feel that they really love each other and they care, or even cared or loved. Maybe it's in the past, but there is there must be a connection. Otherwise, they wouldn't even start to talk to each other. It would just throw things. But um, um, the, what we had to do was just follow these micro movements that are in the script. They are all there. All the pauses were written there. I mean, when Justine thought that somebody would be really angry, she just wrote everything in capital letters and a lot of exclamation marks behind it. So you knew there should be another energy. So um, yeah, so we decided to start very calm because at least one person doesn't know that it's going to be an argument. Um, the other person knows because he's provoking it, uh, which we don't know uh, or, or she doesn't know. So. Yeah, we kind of. I kind of felt either it's going to get to that point or not, but I cannot force it. Um, so we. Tr I really tried to have a conversation with him. That's all. All we did, and we had two days to shoot it, um, and we stopped before the physical action that we never really did physically. We just made the sounds. Uh, because we decided that we don't want to get in any danger or bring the other one in danger and it, it doesn't make sense to slap each other on certain body parts. It's like, <laughs> why, why, why would we do that? Um, yeah, so we always started from the beginning and it was always a complete run through um, with two cameras most of the time so that we could really sit in this situation and I'm very glad that she did it that way, that she didn't like 
do the little pieces and then go back to the beginning and do this part and it really had to build up and develop and it had to be dropped at certain moments where you had the feeling that it's maybe not going on maybe it's finished now until one person wants to go on and then we start again like everybody knows right so yeah kind of yeah really went with this with this dynamic that was written there so perfectly it's just so interesting because he provokes you again and again, this issue of time and bringing up the way you co-parent, which sort of echoes back to the beginning of the film again. And then the responsibility and the relationship. And I think it speaks to an audience of actors that we have here because we all understand like the struggles of a life of an artist and the disparities in a relationship and the, the struggles that can ensue. And when he accuses you of plundering, I just... <laughs> <laughs> Did you... I mean, I imagine that you and he both just believed a very different narrative of events. Yeah, there are two truths next to each other. That's also what this film is about, at least two. And uh, yeah, so I could just leave his truth to him and yeah, just go with mine. I mean, she had a solution. They could just, he could just take something from her, but, <laughs> no. I think it's a really fascinating, the end of this movie haunts me, mm. because I feel, oh, I know, it's terrible, I'm so emotional, it's ridiculous, pull myself together. Um, me too, I don't, I can never go in, um, when, <laughs> in this list, I can't go in, it always, does something to me, not because of me, but because of the whole the setup and the, yeah, and the music and the dog and yeah. But I also I, think I know what you mean. It's a realization that the courtroom drama was something that you were accused of, that you had to get through, but now it's like back to life. It's the realization that you've lost a husband and your son has lost a father and that there was erosion, of, the two of you are together now and there has been a massive I think, erosion of trust. And in a way, in so many ways, it's a new beginning. Yeah. Yes, it is. And they don't know how, both of them don't know how. There was a version of that last scene with the son where he, uh, when she wants to leave, the room, he says that uh, he doesn't want her to use him as material in his next book. She had to promise, and she says she can't. So that was, that was what we actually played, and she just took the silence, which I find the right decision. But they were actually discussing how this would go on, and she would stick to her process, even in front of her son. Um, yeah, I understood, but I also understand that she chose otherwise. Um, and this kind of, I really don't know how they live together. Sometimes I have the fa a fantasy that there will be a lot of people in the house so it's just so they don't need to be just the two of them. Yeah. Do you have any advice for actors in regard with regard to performing something that you have not experienced in life? Just do it. <laughs> I love it. It's, yeah, I think there is no, I mean, that's what we're doing. We pretend. We have an audience question, two audience questions from one gentleman, Oscar McFarlane. Oh. And the first, Oscar, are you in here? So his first question is, was there some improvisation or was it all scripted? It was all scripted. There might be one or two moments where, because Justine loves to let the camera roll after we said everything. And especially with Swan, it went on and on and on. We could have played for hours. So there were like 20 different versions of the ending of the argument that they have on the top of the mountain when they are outside of the car. Um, because they get back into the car and we had like, I don't know, 20 different endings. Um, and I think when she's, when she's making the DVD, she will show it all. I'm embarrassed already. <laughs> but um, no, it was all scripted and yeah. I think talking about Swan quickly, that that last scene when you're in the restaurant and you cup his face in your hands 
And, uh, you know, this is a moment, unlike many in the movie, where there are no words, is absolutely masterful. It's so authentic and so honest. And if you haven't seen the rest of the film, you can watch the, that minute and know exactly what's going on. It's really illustrative. Yeah, that's, that's really directing. I mean, she said that she wanted to have exactly this gesture. We were discussing if there would be a kiss and in early versions of the script there was also a love story and they were in bed and all this stuff. And Marie-Ange Luciani, the, the producer, who was a very smart woman, said, cut it out, it's so 80s, please. <laughs> and, and she's right. So it's all somewhere in the past or between us and it never shows. So Justine was insisting that there is no kiss uh, in, this, in this end, that it doesn't go on. And then Oscar's last question, and I think this will be the last question of the evening. Okay. I believe Sandra Voiter is innocent. Do you believe she is innocent or guilty? I don't know. <laughs> I really have to, I have to be honest all the time. I really don't know. Sometimes I have nightmares that I did it all wrong. <laughs> um, sometimes I even call Justine and say, did we do the right thing? Um, I really don't know. I, I think... She is somebody who could, who had, who had the capacity to do something like that. And I always stopped in my imagination when I had to imagine that she would take into account, that she would like accept the fact that the son would find the father in the snow. That is so cruel. I, I can't like wrap my head around this thought. And that's always where everything else I could somewhat imagine that she's so cruel or fed up or whatever, all these things, but not this, there was something. Smoking. Yeah, pretending smoking like nothing. When he comes yeah. Back. Yeah. yeah, but I wanted her to be someone who we think of that she could be capable of it. That she's a bit dangerous because why not? And I will say, I went to see this with a male friend and as soon as it finished, we started talking about it. And he was as convinced as Oscar is that you're innocent, he was convinced that you were guilty. And I thought that that was what was absolutely f the most remarkable thing about this movie, that it's so clear to me that she's innocent, and yet this gentleman was absolutely convinced that she was guilty. That's a brilliant Yeah, it's all about projection. That's the great thing about it. We leave, yeah, we leave everything to the heads of the audience. And I think that's kind of Justine's masterful directing that's really crazy she did a lot of um uh, screen like test screenings and there were versions where everybody thought she was guilty and there were versions where everybody thought she was innocent and she wanted to find exactly the middle of it so she kind of balanced it out with her wonderful editor um to always choose the versions where you just don't really know because of course we played versions because when you do like 15 20 takes each time you have all sorts of you can be really rude to the to the to the lawyer, and you can be really good rude to the prosecutor, and you could also cry. You could be a good victim, and you know all these things. But she always chose the in between. I feel like I lied. I have one more question, um, and and I don't know if everybody knows that there is another film that's doing the tour this year, Zone of Interest, which is the British entry, f and. Um, you also turn in an absolute, one of these performances in a lifetime would be impressive, but both of these performances in a year, can you just quickly, I know we're talking about Anatomy of a Fall, give us a quick overview of what you are proud of, what feels like an accomplishment to you about your character in Zone of Interest? Nothing. I really have to know. It doesn't feel like an accomplishment. It, it would feel weird to me if I would speak of an accomplishment. Um, I think that Jonathan did something with this team. He made s the, the artistic decisions that this team has made to put it like next to the original camp, to rebuild the house, to work with this 10 camera system, to, to create this atmosphere of surveillance or a presence of something that we don't know, gave us an opportunity to be present in a way that it's yeah it's unlike anything else that I've, I've I've never done anything like this before and not because of me but because of this setup and of course because of Christian Friedel my partner and um, 
No, I don't. I don't feel like I've, I've accomplished anything with that. No. So, what do you want to do next? What is left for you? Is there a character? Is there a role? Is there a play? I want to go on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to let you get out of here. It's been a late night. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.